University, as you know, uh, it's a university uh, based in Ankara, uh, but uh, we do have two more campuses. Uh, well, actually, uh, uh, we have two campuses in Turkey. There's a campus in Cyprus as well, Meti, uh, Northern Cyprus uh, campus. Our campus is in Mersin, that's southern Turkey by the Mediterranean, uh, near Mersin. There's a large town called Mersin, uh, over a million population. So, uh, and we have a campus entirely dedicated to, to marine sciences here. I'm not sure if you can see the uh, web page of our, of our campus, of our institute, but uh, uh, we do have actually, this is a graduate school in its essence. Uh, we have uh, master's and graduate and doctoral programs, postdoctoral programs. Uh, and we are about 20 faculty members here uh, with about 30 uh, graduate students at the moment. Uh, it's, a, it's an institute uh, similar to this, for example, HCMR in Greece. Maybe some of you heard about it. They also have a couple of campuses in Athens and in, in, uh, in Crete, I think. Uh, in a way, this is the uh, National Oceanographic Center of Turkey. So uh, yes, uh, we do accept uh, graduate level applications two times a year, the same as METU. Uh, but what's more important, our campus is also quite, uh, uh, I'm sure Korhan is also will be talking about tomorrow, but uh, our campus itself is also an asset in itself with its costs, uh, species, uh, nature, we have our own harbor, our own beach, uh, which we try to protect and uh, you know, uh, develop the stewardship of. Um, but what's nice maybe for the future of this workshop, we are also at the moment, uh, we had a lot of progress uh, in uh, the building or in the transformation of an existing facility towards a conference workshop venue, which, uh, which is a project quite familiar to our uh, colleagues from Eco Evo Society but uh, hopefully next year or in the following year, we will be also able to hold um, workshops in our own campus. So uh, in this institute, um, I coordinate the uh, deep sea research group. This is more informal working group, uh, people interested in deep sea research, developing a thesis about deep sea research. Uh, we mainly work at, uh, as we will talk a lot today, uh, deep sea hydrothermal vents, uh, oxygen deficient environments like the Black Sea and Marmara, also some other places. Uh, shallow water hydrothermal vents is also a focus. They don't have to be deep. Uh, we do have a lot of those sort of systems in the Aegean Sea. And there are also a few other interests, nanogeoscience, geochemistry, some details of geochemistry. Currently, of course, uh, uh, I have uh, six students uh, graduate students working with me and uh, there are also a couple of students uh, more based in Ankara campus but you can check out our institute and group web pages to, to learn more about latest about what we do what we are trying to aim at so from the chat I see that uh, let's quickly before starting the slides let's quickly review your uh, okay uh, so Maria hi Maria she's a bioinformatician Kumanch uh, his expert is in biotech. Uh, Violetta from Stockholm University, very, very nice uh, biology and uh, genetics and molecular biology, but she lacks population genetics. Don't worry, I also don't have much idea about population genetics. Uh, yeah, Zela is from Hadjettepe University. Uh, Birgül from uh, I don't know which university, but from molecular biology, Melike, she is uh, one of our own. Uh, molecular biology, uh, Ioli, uh, animal science and aquaculture, that's very interesting, very relevant. Sena from Ankara University, hi, agriculture engineering. Uh, there is Nur Bahar as well, <laughs> which we know very well, ecologist. Uh, Esra Meryem, molecular biology, evolution biology. Uh, Esta Başak, evolution biology. So uh, Nefeli, molecular phylogeny. Yeshim, Erol, invasive biology, very interesting, very relevant for uh, the Eastern Mediterranean and Black Sea, especially. 
very prolific subject. Uh, Cheval is working on evolution biology, Ekaterina working on environmental biology in Heraklion, uh, in Crete, I guess. Katerina uh, working on also environmental biology. Matt Jan, I know him very well. He, he works on uh, microbiology of the Black Sea. Medina uh, from Black Sea Coast, on Dokuz Mace University, very, very interesting, very good biology. Gökhan works on taxonomical zoology. Uh, Alpida works on biology, especially mitonuclear uh, coevolution. Very, very interesting. Love to hear more on that. Uh, Arjan from Koch University, uh, molecular biology and genetics. Nikos, uh, environmental biology. Didem, uh, biology. Nerve is also from Matthew, molecular biology. Burcu Tekin, biotech. DR. Uh, molecular biology, genetics, Elif molecular biology, or touch is also biology. Uh, John's evolution biology, Simeon, entomology, and molecular phylogeny. Merich is working on evolution genetics, Rehan, ancient DNA, molecular biology. Congratulations, by the way. That's, uh, I, I think, uh, your paper that you, you first authored has been in the news, if I'm not mistaken, right? So very well done. Uh, well done. Functional ecology and uh, limnology. Uh, phylogenetics, Özgül is working on phylogenetics. Betül Bitir Soylu is working on molecular biology, paleoecology, and uh, Elif Deniz is working on ecology. So very nice, very, very uh, uh, strong backgrounds, seems like, from, uh, from different uh, fields of ecology and evolution, biology and genetics. So as I've said, uh, I'm not a molecular biologist or geneticist by myself. I'm a chemical engineer, then trained later on uh, with ocean sciences. So I have a rather general knowledge of uh, ecology. Uh, maybe I'm more specialized on microbiology of uh, deep and extreme environments, which I will be talking about a little bit. So this course will not be in that, you know, uh, you will have other courses this week, which will go really deep into different aspects of molecular biology of uh, ecological applications, let's say, of molecular biology. But uh, today, this morning, especially FA asked me to, in a way, uh, set the stage uh, of earth evolution, uh, life in the oceans, how it's possible and how we got into into the current uh, biodiversity that we observe uh, currently on Earth. So actually I have a lot to, to show you, uh, but I will rather take my time and uh, I invite you to really interact, just interrupt and uh, you can raise your hand or uh, I don't know, maybe Kuwanch can also, uh, our moderator is also, uh, maybe can monitor uh, if there's a question in chat box or if there's a raise raised hand, uh, because through Zoom, it's already distant, difficult. So the more interaction, the merrier, to be honest. Okay, so let's get started. Um, if you, uh, do you have any questions before, before I start? Okay, this course is about uh, biogeochemistry. So there are roughly three parts that I'd like to discuss until uh, 12 o'clock today with you. The first part will be a general introduction to biogeochemistry and the evolution of, uh, let's say, a very early evolution, right? This is a biogeochemical evolution, let's say. I will not go into plant evolution or, or macrofaunal evolution, but microbial, we will discuss some aspects of microbial evolution on Earth, origin of life. And before that, we will also uh, look at formation of uh, the Earth, formation of even solar system. They are all related in a way. And then uh, in the second part of the course, we will more discuss modern day uh, biogeochemical cycles of oxygen, uh, nitrogen. So these are main elements actually, which, which derive carbon as well. Uh, then in the third part, I'd like to go into a little bit uh, more into the extreme environments, the ecology, uh, biology of extreme environments. So maybe now that I, I, uh, I have an idea about your backgrounds, so maybe I can, uh, I may try to keep the second part a little bit short and general 
maybe discuss more about the evolutionary aspects and uh, the current ecology around the extreme environment. So maybe uh, I'll try to organize my time like this. So biogeochemistry, it's actually, as the name implies, it's a very multidisciplinary field. Uh, it is, uh, of course, a combination of uh, chemistry, geology, uh, biology, but there's also physics. Uh, you cannot interpret biogeochemical distributions in nature without a basic uh, appreciation of physical uh, dynamics. Uh, for example, we have people with us, uh, limnologists, right? So uh, they may also know very well that you need to constrain mixing statification of the lake, uh, mixing periods, statification periods. So you need to, uh, whatever you do, biogeochemistry, ecology, you need to first also have an understanding of the, uh, of the uh, uh, physical context. Biogeochemistry, is, there's also another field called geochemistry, which is more about actually, uh, it's like a spin-off of geology. So geologists tend to be geochemists and the geochemistry more implies uh, uh, larger time frames. So, for example, isotope applications, paleo uh, geology. So, geochemists deal with those sort of things. Biogeochemistry is more about modern and I would say faster reactions and uh, link to ecology and microbiology. That's that's biogeochemistry. Geochemistry is more about, as I said, uh, uh, figuring out history of Earth with chemical methods, so that's different field, but they are all interlinked, of course. Um, in some other literature, uh, you, you may also see geobiochemistry. But, you know, there's a, there are all kinds of uh, fields, but actually this field is not that new. Uh, trying to switch slides. Uh, it's not very new. Uh, I thought I had a slide about that, but oh yeah, there, there it is. Um, even you know, more than 100 years ago, there was a talk about coupled cycles of elements uh, between the biosphere and the geosphere. So Vernadsky is actually, uh, we consider that uh, he's a founding father of, you know, in order to have a field established, you need to have founding fathers. Unfortunately, they are not mothers, they're always some founding fathers. So here we are, biogeochemists, now we can be, uh, we can sit back and relax. We also have our founding uh, myth uh, with uh, with Vernatsky and uh, we have historical context. Actually, his work is really great, uh, but the, this work was translated into English uh, very late in, in the 70s and 80s. So he's from Ukraine originally. Uh, it was actually translated to French much earlier, but uh, the, the fact that uh, the Western English speaking scientific communities uh, became aware of this in, in late 70s and 80s. So in a way, uh, this, uh, that period also coincided with a, with a renewed interest in this sort of uh, uh, coupled understanding of chemical cycles and planetary cycles so because of climate change and different things. All right. Uh, now let's come back to you. This is actually the idea of my first course, these, these two slides. Uh, I'm sure uh, you are, many of you are quite knowledgeable, a lot more than me about evolution and uh, how life evolved, uh, especially. Uh, but uh, I'm more interested in actually, uh, of course, uh, being a biogeochemist, how, uh, how uh, did the life originate, of course, and then how was the evolution of life, evolution of the first life forms uh, as coupled to the evolution of planetary cycles, planetary biogeochemical cycles. So, so the first thing I think you should know, uh, or if you knew it already, maybe to reinforce it for you, yeah, that's a very fundamental knowledge. This, this um, oxygenation of the atmosphere of our planet uh, happened much, much later after the formation of the planet. So the planet is about 4.5, a billion years old, as you know, uh, maybe there were some traces of oxygen in the very beginning uh, formed by different reactions. It's possible. It's also possible in Mars, in other planetary bodies, so oxygen. But, but um, its stable presence in an atmospheric 
environment uh, requires constant production. And as you know, that became possible only after the uh, evolution of the cyanobacteria, which is kind of dated back to 3.5 billion years. Uh, so the, the, the green line over there in a way shows you very roughly uh, the uh, levels of oxygen, uh, you know, as a, as a per fraction of present day. Uh, sorry, this is the fraction of the total. Uh, currently it's about 0.2, you know, it's 20% it's of the uh, current atmosphere. So, but as you can see, after the first appearance of cyanobacteria, the planet didn't become oxygenated in a day. It took maybe another billion years. So that's called the GOE great oxidation event. So it took another billion years for the uh, atmosphere to be uh, oxygenated with a meaningful amount of oxygen. Because after that, uh, that oxygen really changed a lot of other things in the, on the planet. Uh, but it's important, maybe it's more evident in this figure that uh, the first, uh, uh, I, think, I don't think it's here, no, it's in a later slide. But uh, as I'll, I'll show you later on, uh, eukaryotic evolution, for example, did not happen uh, much, much uh, later. It happened uh, in an area called uh, Proterozoic. So, now back to geology. This is the stuff I also, uh, I never had any courses, but trying to figure out myself. So the, 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 the chaotic first years of, of the earth is called Hadean. That's HDs for that. Then it's the Archean. So when you don't have any oxygen in the atmosphere, it doesn't mean that the organisms are not there. They are there, but the production is not enough to oxygenate the planet. So it's called the Archean. So oxygen is, is actually, the primary parameter in, in the way geologists uh, constructed the, uh, uh, the geologic times. But of course, uh, they're looking at the rocks. So oxygen is really a main actor shaping what kind of rocks can be deposited on Earth. So Archean is actually called, uh, is an era where you don't have any oxygen in the atmosphere. And this is the ocean chemistry, by the way. Uh, ocean chemistry was dominated by more chemically reducing compounds rather than the oxidized form of compounds. You have reduced form of compounds. Uh, and uh, after the great oxidation event happening around 2.5 billion years, uh, then part of the, uh, of course, the atmosphere was oxygenated, but the upper part of the oceans started to become oxygenated, but the lower part still remained anoxic uh, and uh, in certain places uh, there was an accumulation of hydrogen sulfide. That's uh, pretty much like the present day Black Sea, by the way. We'll come to that. Then uh, after about 600 to 500 billion years ago, we started to have a more widespread deep oxygenation of the oceans as well. So the earth looked pretty much like today in that regard. Uh, in the oceans, you started to accumulate oxidized form of elements, nitrogen, carbon, sulfur. Uh, so oxygen became quite, quite uh, predominant. And uh, that also coincides with the uh, Cambrian explosion, as, as some of you know very well, the evolution of the multicellular organisms, etc. Here in the upper, upper graph, you see actually, there's a whole, whole lot of research at the moment going on about this. Uh, these transitions, they don't happen in isolation from other biogeochemical cycles, for example, metals. Okay, I'm not going to go into this very much today, but, but um, the availability of different metals uh, was also a key factor uh, because metals form a cofactor of, as you know, enzymes uh, or different metalloproteins, which, which take different functions. They don't need to be enzymes, they can be carriers of oxygen in blood, for example like hemoglobin, so you need also metals to be supplied, which is all related to the ocean chemistry, by the way. And uh, this is one of the frontier topics. If Since you're also, uh, uh, maybe you may be looking for different subjects for your research, or just showing you also some frontier areas in, in, in between my, my slides. All right, so uh, let's, we'll get back to this. I will also relate this to the eukaryotic evolution which happened somewhere here. 
according to what they, they tell us. All right, let's, let's get back to biogeochemistry again. Uh, it's a field uh, we deal with, uh, it's like ecology in a way, actually the same, eco it's the same way ecology deals with many, many levels, spatial and temporal levels, scales, uh, biogeochemistry is the same. Uh, actually biogeochemistry and ecology, they are really, really closely related. You can consider biogeochemistry as the, uh, as the fundamental mechanisms operating behind supplying nutrients, carbon uh, to the food web. Of course, the food web itself also shapes all these biogeochemical cycles, but uh, the study of the chemical flow of this biogeochemistry. Uh, as you can see from single cells to ecosystem level processes, a whole lot going on, community level, population level, and ecosystem level processes. Uh, in biogeochemistry at the same time, we tend to have some understanding of the biology, but we also have some understanding of geology. Uh, you need to also know what sort of long-term cycles are operating behind. So rock cycle, for example, is something, again, whatever you do, uh, it's good for you to know uh, basics of rock cycles. Uh, this is a very, very basic representation, but what we have basically a magma, which is beneath the, the Earth's crust, you know, from time to time, uh, it approaches to the surface. Uh, it can form intrusions in subsurface, just solidify there, then it, it's, it's called igneous rocks, but intrusive igneous rocks, or they can be uh, expelled through volcanoes, uh, through lava, to the, to the surface of the Earth, they can solidify and they become extrusive igneous rocks. Then they can be weathered, with the action of rain or wind, and this this weather products, they can deposit, redeposit as sediments, then they become sedimentary rocks. So sedimentary or igneous rocks, both intrusive or extrusive rocks, they can be uh, metamorphized. Okay, it's more like a secondary process where already formed rocks, they become melted or under high pressure and high temperature, they, they transform into other rocks. So just to know that, uh, just for you to know that, uh, we are sitting on a very dynamic planet with a very dynamic cycles. On the other scale, uh, we also need to think about our biogeochemical cycles, our long-term cycles operating in our particular environment. But we also need to know about uh, uh, processes occurring at the uh, organism scale. Then, of course, you may ask, okay, which organism? Because a bacterium is very different from a, from a tuna fish or whale. So uh, then the, your process of interest, of course, will be different across those skills. For example, uh, highly mobile megafauna, such as whale, of course, uh, it will not be limited by diffusive fluxes of, of uh, carbon or nitrogen, but the bacteria bacteria will be dependent on that because of its size and because of its limited uh, mobility it may not be mobile at all okay not all bacterial mobile some some are mobile some are not so they will be depending on on the diffusion for example and diffusion is slow uh, compared to uh, you know a highly mobile organism such as a shrimp you know it can move around access to resources but bacteria cannot so that's why uh, in microbial life, especially, uh, the microbial life is really, really, really coupled on uh, the chemical environment around because uh, most of the resources, they can access to most of the resources through diffusion only. So these are different aspects that, that you need to be thinking about. Uh, th these aspects are true for ecology, I think. I think you would agree with that. Any questions or any contributions? So far, I uh, don't see any. So we'll now, uh, I will discuss a little bit of, okay, now I will take you back to all the way to Big Bang. <laughs> of course, uh, all these information, you know, the Big Bang or formation of elements, formation of solar system, the information mostly comes from geochemistry. Applications of isotopes, for example, there are some elements with really long half-lives. So they decay, but over a billion years. 
and then they, they can be used as a clock to date different things. Uh, the Big Bang, of course, uh, the Big Bang, uh, the origin of the universe is estimated to be around 14 billion years ago, I think 14 and a half, something like that, or 12. Anyway, plus minus a few billion years. Uh, no, I think they have much better constraint than that, but uh, uh, what happened basically for, for a geochemistry point of view, first uh, element uh, which hung around was hydrogen. Then hydrogen fused into helium. Then helium, different helium atoms, they, they fused to carbon. And then through fusion, calcium and different elements up to iron was produced. But the fusion is basically you know, a combination of elements. You fuse things into different new elements. But beyond iron, this fusion was not that energetic. Uh, but different processes, such as uh, alpha, alpha process, uh, gamma process, uh, and fission processes came into play. Different combination of processes acted together to, to fabricate elements with higher masses than iron. OK? So where did this happen? Actually, uh, the formation of most elements already happened before the formation of solar system. It happened in, in very, very uh, large stars, larger than our sun, uh, in, in really large stars uh, with the action of temperature and pressure. Uh, we happen to have been delivered all these elements to our solar system, okay? But they are not fabricated in the solar system. Currently in the solar system, our sun can also only fabricate, of course, there's hydrogen, but helium. And that's uh, pretty much it. All the elements were delivered at time zero, 4.5 4, 4 billion years ago to the solar system. And the rest is redistribution, pretty much, OK? Um, and that's the current solar system. Of course, here the planets, planets are ranked with their sizes, I think. Uh, I even see Pluto here, which shows that it's an old slide. Pluto shouldn't be there anyway. It's disclassified as a, as a planet. It appears that we have many Pluto-like objects out there in that uh, orbital range of the, of the sun. So. People don't know, didn't know how to proceed, so they canceled Pluto's status as a, as a planet. So, um, but um, according to the sun, of course, most of the mass of our solar system uh, is in the sun. So, just some uh, ideas about how uh, the solar system formed. Uh, of course, everything was dust, gas, and dust, as you know, in the beginning. Uh, then the slow rotating cloud of gas and dust due to gravitational contraction. Uh, a center of gravity basically formed uh, and the sun that became the sun. Uh, physics tells us that uh, you can make things happen, but the angular momentum should be uh, conserved. And at the moment, this, this angular momentum is conserved, of course, in the rotation of sun, but also in the rotation, uh, the orbital motions of the planets. Okay. Uh, so what happened to all this gas and dust in the end became a sun and, and uh, they concentrated on different orbits to, to, to build different planets. Inner planets are most small and dense. Outer planets are, are large, but they have low density. Actually, the idea is, is really simple here. The heavy elements, they stay close to the gravitational center, which is the sun. But the gas, water especially, they tend to be located away from the sun because they are lighter. And there are really nice discoveries today. For example, uh, we have actually a lot of water. We are finding out that there's a lot of water out there in the solar system, especially in the outer planets. Uh, some outer planets are icy, uh, Pluto, for example. Uh, uh, but, uh, but some, uh, most satellites of outer planets, they're also icy. So there's ice. And there's also a big dis discovery about uh, waters, actually, ocean salt waters behind those uh, icy crust. Anyway, uh, so there's a lot of water in our solar system. There's a lot of potential for microbial life, at least. Uh, there are also failed planets, such as the asteroid belt. Maybe you see in the news about this, uh, oops, I have it like that. The asteroid Aide, I think uh, there was a Japanese mission uh, who landed, they landed on an asteroid and sampled. It's now bringing back samples. 
but uh, there is such a such an environment between Mars and Jupiter. Failed planet in a way. All right. Uh, so then, uh, after this initial phase of gas and dust, how uh, was the uh, planetary formation? It's relatively simple. Particles they stick together, they aggregate. And again, physicist tells us that once your body of uh, protoplanet, the diameter of this body exceeds 500 kilometers, then it starts to have that sort of uh, gravity on its own. And so the larger it gets, the, the more it attracts different particles. So it's what happens on Earth. Maybe I can go back to where is my differentiation it's later. Oh yeah, yes. So what we have uh, for our Earth, for example, uh, there was a sort of protoplanet, uh, which was as a result of aggregation of the particles in that orbit. And uh, initially this was not differentiated. Differentiation meaning that, you know, now we have a crust right here, we have a crust, an iron core, and a liquid co outer core a rather fluid astronosphere and uh, there's a solid crust. In the beginning, it was not like that. Um, the, the, the Earth was rather homogeneous, but over time, iron, for example, being heavy uh, or nickel, so those sort of metals being uh, big elements, they migrated towards the center of gravity, towards the center of the Earth. That's why the core, currently our core is estimated to be mostly made up of iron and nickel. Okay, so these are rather uh, uh, straightforward concepts. And of course, water, different gases, uh, they accumulate also in the atmosphere and in the crust. So this is called differentiation, by the way, differentiation uh, of the earth. Uh, some details which you can, uh, we can provide these slides to you, you can. That's the asteroid idea that I, I've been talking about. Why are they important? Because these asteroids, they also tell you uh, the origin of our planet because they are kind of frozen in time. Uh, they are as 4.5 billion years ago. They didn't change much uh, while our Earth changed a lot due to volcanism, plate tectonics. But these asteroids didn't change much. So they are very valuable samples uh, if you want to understand the origin of the solar system. Okay, maybe these are uh, details for you, but again, it's good for you to, to know general structure of the Earth, uh, because uh, nowadays papers, especially good papers, uh, in a given good paper, you will see concepts from geology, from microbiology, evolution. Uh, so, for example, in, a, in an evolutionary paper, you may all of a sudden see lithosphere or atmosphere, these sort of concepts. So. A lithosphere is the solid outer envelope of our uh, planet. Astronosphere is uh, is the is the layer beneath it. It's it's fluid. In a way, the lithosphere is is floating around above this astronosphere. Um, the mantle uh, is their mantle is the general, let's say, uh, name for this this mineral rich, uh, rather fluid. It's not entirely liquid, but uh, people think it's fluid. There's there are convection cells in the stand. Okay. And, and the core is, outer core is definitely fluid because magnetism comes from there. All right, so maybe I'll skip this. Uh, cross evolution. This is interesting, again, from an evolutionary point of view. In the, in the graph below, you see the volume of the contents. So as you can see, the volume of the continents uh, was not at all constant. It, it uh, enlarged over time. And uh, as it enlarged, of course, you start the continents, more continents showing up above water. And then uh, at one point, uh, you found actual supercontinents, which came together and they became broken up, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, people estimate now that the, the, in a way, the classical uh, formation or, or the classical distribution of continents didn't happen, you know, until, uh, let's say, 1 billion, 1.5 billion years ago. 
especially, after, especially before the great oxidation event, as you can see, uh, the volume of content was, was really low. So it appears like the earth was more like an ocean and uh, some land masses showed up here and there. But uh, over time we had more and more contents. See, there's a chat box, there's a... Uh, yes, why failed planets, planets failed from LP? A very, very good question. Uh, according to what I read, of course, it's because of Jupiter. Uh, it was in a, in a such a location that it, it, uh, the attraction from Jupiter uh, didn't allow these uh, pieces of stuff <laughs> actually stick together. And, and uh, because enough time has passed since the formation of solar system, this stuff should have been sticking together to make a planet. But according to my reading, it's Jupiter. Jupiter ended up being so large that uh, it didn't allow uh, this particular pieces of rocks to become a planet. Of course, you may ask them why Saturn became a planet. That's after Jupiter that I don't know. But very good question. I think it's just about forces, uh, orbital dynamics, uh, uh, and, and uh, it's, it's not about nature of material there. It's the same material which made up the Earth. That's for sure. But, but for, for uh, probably gravitational reasons, uh, the, those sets of rocks, they were not in the lucky spot, let's say. <laughs> That's the best answer I can give. But of course, then why Jupiter didn't affect Saturn, then that, that becomes another question. Maybe Jupiter is too close. We need to look at the distances. Maybe the distance between Jupiter and Saturn is not, maybe it's high, but maybe, maybe this, this orbit is too close to Jupiter. So we can check the distances between planets to check for that idea. But yeah, essentially, uh, it's another force acting uh, against the uh, uh, coming together of these particles. Uh, I think, uh, again, if I remember correctly, uh, the particles, the, 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 the sizes of objects in that failed planet orbit, they are, it's getting smaller and smaller. So things are becoming, for some reason, smaller and smaller in that particular uh, failed planet belt. Uh, I need to check this idea, but I think that's, that's, that's what I remember. If any, you know, if any one of you are interested in space, maybe you can, you can add. So uh, this tells you a lot, right? At the moment, one of the big questions is also uh, about exoplanets. Maybe you, you heard about it. Exoplanets are uh, basically planets of other star systems. So uh, it appears that there are many Earth-like planets in terms of distance. Uh, well, there are many actual stars with the size of Sun, and there are many, many planets uh, suitable for... Uh, yeah, at least it's in the right distance to, to the Sun, to, 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 to their particular star, which is like Sun. And uh, they also estimate that the, the size of those planets are also similar to Earth. So a big question in astronomy now is to detect exoplanets and to, to be able to detect at least some chemistry of those planets to see if there's a sign of life. Of course, not an easy undertaking, but uh, when you are a planet, you need to be in the right spot to, to enjoy. Uh, to, to, uh, we will come to that later, but the Earth is lucky because in a way uh, it was, in, of course, right spot in terms of temperature. Uh, but it wasn't too cold or too hot so that uh, the Earth was able to retain its water, for example. Otherwise, Mars also had water, as you know. Now, we are very sure that Mars had its water, oceans, lakes. But uh, at least for the past two billion years, the, uh, there's no water, uh, there's very little water left on Mars. It got just evaporated, escapes of space. You need to have a high enough gravity and you also need to be in a way, uh, you shouldn't be very hot. Uh, so, uh, and volcanism also helps, which actually, which is about my next discussion, which is here. Uh, yes, the formation of the continents, yes, you talk about it, but how were the oceans formed? Uh, 
the oceans, actually the water on Earth, of course, the Earth contains some water in the beginning, uh, but in the early Earth, there was also a lot of uh, bombardment of the Earth by, uh, by asteroids. Uh, of course, once an asteroid hits the Earth, it's called a met meteor, not an asteroid. Uh, so meteors actually brought a lot of water with, with themselves. Too. So you may ask, where is the water in such an asteroid? Okay, it looks solid rock to me. You know, you may ask, where is the, the water is inside. Part of the rocks, it's bound, chemically bound to, to, the, to the minerals. So once, once this type of stuff hits the earth, hopefully it will not, but <laughs> in our lifetime, but it, it, some, one day something will hit. Uh, once something like it hits the earth, of course it becomes a vapor pretty much quickly. And then and this water is liberated. So people think that this sort of bombardment by meteorites uh, brought a lot of water to the earth, but also earth had since the beginning and still has a lot of volcanism uh, because the earth's interior still contains water and this water is transferred to the surface via volcanism. So uh, volcanism and this meteors, they collectively brought a lot of water to the earth, which was able to be retained on the surface thanks to the special location of Earth and the high gravity relative to Mars, for example. So anyway, I'll, I'll skip this crustal formation. A lot of interesting stuff. Moon is very interesting, for example. I don't want to go into very much in geology, but uh, Moon is also kind of very ancient material. Does anyone know how the Moon formed? There are some older theories about, oh, it's, you know, the Pacific Ocean floor is a remnant of moon, for example. I, I remember reading that type of stuff. But uh, the current theory is that uh, the, the moon actually formed much later, after about six, 700 million years after the formation of Earth. And now the, the, the very recent idea is that the Earth, in the beginning, it shared its orbit with another planet called Theia. And you know, two, two planets cannot, eventually they collide. They cannot occupy the same orbit, laws of physics. So they, they collided and the Earth won, apparently, okay. Otherwise uh, we would be evolving on a planet called Theia. But now we, we are hanging around the planet Earth because the Earth was somehow uh, uh, won this, this collision. But this leftover of this collision uh, was uh, was the moon. It, it, it became the moon. So and then of course the moon froze in terms. In a way, it's a sample. The moon is a, uh, a sample out there waiting for us to be, to be sampled, and it, it records what happened basically four four billion years ago in our orbit. So that's another added value of why we should be still looking at moon as a scientific. Uh, site. All right, uh, I will be maybe skipping now these parts. Now uh, we are almost into well into our first hour. Evidence of water will, I, I've given you the main idea, but uh, maybe also I'll briefly define what minerals are. So these are the maybe, uh, it's a bad slide, but it, it gives you the main idea. So maybe it's for you important to also have you know, have an idea back of your head. Uh, that's the current atmospheric composition, right? We all know it's very oxygen and, and nitrogen, some other gases as well. Uh, but in the in the beginning, the Earth contained much much higher amounts of actually gases in the atmosphere, and that was mostly CO2, and of course a lot of methane, ammonia. Nitrogen was still out there, as you can see, and there's a lot of water in the, in the very beginning. This is important. You may ask, wow, CO2, water, these are all what, these are greenhouse gases, right? So the earth must be, uh, must be like a hell, just very warm. Well, the, the thing is, uh, this is a good thing, actually, this, this early greenhouse effect, because uh, uh, in those early days, uh, the sun was much, much less stronger. So it was smaller and, and uh, heating up less. Uh, they call this the faint young sun hypothesis. Uh, so this, this high greenhouse condition of the earth helped in a way. So, so the earth didn't froze 
uh, in those years. Uh, so it was relatively kept warm and suitable for evolution. Okay, and uh, as you know, as the stars age, they tend to just generate more and more energy, and then they they enlarge, which will also happen to our sun at one point. Thank, thankfully, we will not be around when that happens. All right. So let me also briefly chat about minerals. Uh, I'm just showing you because uh, uh, it's also very coupled to actual evolution of, of life on our planet. Uh, what are minerals? Minerals are, we've talked about elements. Basically elements, they make up minerals. Minerals are like actually any chemical compound, but they have some other specifications. They have to be naturally forming and inorganic, inorganic meaning carbon hydrogen bonds. So they don't have uh, carbon hydrogen bonds uh, in the way a uh, biological material has. They are crystalline solids, that's important. So you, they need to have orderly arranged uh, atoms inside them. And the most important, they have very measurable and different physical properties and chemical compositions. So minerals make up rocks. Uh, yeah, so more on physical properties, some, some examples of minerals. I'm sure you, you've been hearing about this in your readings, uh, different papers, maybe you don't realize uh, they are uh, minerals, but some examples of minerals, they can have very simple formula. For example, quartz, the beach sand, CO2, uh, they can have very complicated formula, right? So, uh, All right, so maybe this is, I thought I'm showing you an interesting aspect of mineralogy. Uh, and maybe you'll get interested in this too because many of you are already familiar with evolution. Uh, this is the number of different mineral species in a way. So mineral species, mineral types. Uh, so uh, you can see at the moment we are here, we have around what, 400, 4,000 plus mineral species, mineral types on our planet. Uh, but it's interesting, they estimate that in the beginning, uh, in the uh, formation of Earth, uh, there were only, you know, a handful of mineral uh, types, uh, different minerals on our planet. Then gradually as the Earth uh, evolved, you know, as the earth uh, started to develop the geochemical cycles and life started to evolve on it, uh, the number of different minerals that exist on earth also increased in number. So there, we can talk about the mineral diversification, even a mineral evolution, if, if we can talk about such a thing. So in a way, evolution uh, is not only, uh, uh, of course, it depends on how we define it, right? But on a philosophical basis, you can also apply uh, evolution principles maybe to, to non-living world, right? Uh, of course, the other instructors of this principle, they will have much, much better ideas than me about this, but, but at least these data show me that the number of minerals uh, are divide, diversifying over time as the earth ages. So there must be some, something going on. Uh, you may be asking why, but I, I again, I would like to focus your attention to this interval because this is about oxygen, which is the main subject of my next lecture. But again, the fact that oxygen became abundant in the atmosphere around 2.5, you see, it had a huge influence on the mineralogy of Earth. All of a sudden, uh, maybe this is because you had more options to diversify, right, with the introduction of oxygen. We still don't know, but at least the geologic record matches uh, with, with some major events of Earth's history. So these are number of mineral species, cumulative number, and these are some main events in Earth history. For example, uh, number five is the start of plate tectonics. Okay, so that's an accelerating force. Um, the fact that life evolved after 2.9 billion years, it's, it's a major driving force. Great oxidation event, apparently it's a, it's a major event. And uh, now actually we are in an era of, uh, it's been in the past 500 million years, more and more minerals are made and that's also related to bio 
So innovation of new minerals by biology. So in a way, the number of minerals, uh, different minerals are increasing. Mineral, uh, minerals are also diversifying just as the uh, living world in a way. Here you can see more details about uh, we still don't understand why and how. Let, let's uh, let, let's put it this way. Uh, this doesn't imply great causation. I mean, we are not saying that uh, you know the, the start of tectonics produced more minerals. It can be also vice versa. Okay, maybe a diversification of a certain mineral changed something else. So okay, we are not really fully. We are far from fully understanding how this coupled evolution of life and, and geochemistry occurred, but uh, there are apparent causation relationships. All right, uh, I'll, I'll skip these parts. These are the first 12 or so minerals that were delivered to the earth, by the way. Uh, titanium, magnesium, iron, aluminum, okay, the carbon nanoparticles, so all kinds of different minerals were already produced in the nebula. Uh, an interesting aspect of mineral evolution is not all minerals evolve the same. For example, here you see beryllium containing minerals. Uh, you see there are certain jumps in its history. Uh, you can take a look at boron, for example, that boron minerals. It also contains, uh, uh, it shows similar jumps, similar to beryllium. But, uh, and yeah, why, why this happens? An important aspect of uh, diversifying minerals, uh, as I said before, we had more and more continents on Earth and these continents started to collide uh, with each other to make supercontinents. And of course, after that, they, they broke up. But at the moment, we can date five supercontinents, uh, Kenorland, Columbia, uh, Rodinia, Panatia, and Pangea at last one. And now we are in the breaking apart phase, of course, uh, which is very, very crucial, as you know, these supercontinent cycles, very, very important driver of evolutionary biology, of course. And in this case, uh, I like to demonstrate that it also became very important in making, producing new minerals. So the jumps in the mineralogy diversification mostly coincided with the, uh, with the super content formation. So the more actually action you have, the more possibilities you have apparently. Okay. Uh, but you don't see, for example, this pattern in mercury. You see, uh, these are the super continent. These are new mercury minerals uh, because the mercury mineral, the formation of mercury minerals was more happening in the ocean. And uh, especially in this, in this uh, period where we didn't have any, any uh, uh, new mercury mineral formation, the, the mercury was quite soluble in the ocean. The ocean chemistry was quite soluble, uh, making mercury quite soluble because of hydrogen sulfide. Uh, anyway, it's a detail, but this is showing you that different elements behave differently, but we can speak about a evolution of uh, different minerals over time, which happens to coincide with major geological events. Uh, and again, it's important to re-emphasize that uh, in a way life at the moment, especially in the very modern times, the evolution of uh, life, diversification of life directly shapes the surface uh, mineralogy. Uh, Probably as humans, we are also now inventing new minerals. We don't know that uh, because of our actions, we introduce more CO2, we introduce a lot of chemical contaminants. You, you never know, we are changing the chemistry of the atmosphere and oceans, which will have some implications uh, in, the, in the geologic record. We are introducing a lot of plastics, right? What's gonna happen to all those plastic particles? Maybe it will go <laughs> induce some, some new mineral formation. We don't know that, but future generations will be uh, probably looking at our era. Uh, I think uh, maybe the plastic, uh, layer of plastics in the rock record will show us that, oh, 
humans lived in this era anyway. At least uh, uh, it will be the landmark of our times. All right, maybe we'll do a break here and I'll continue with wrapping up this, this discussion of long-term uh, coupled evolution of, of uh, maybe I'll, yeah, uh, I'll wrap up. When we come back, I'll wrap up this discussion uh, relating uh, evolution to especially evolution of metabolism and microbiology, then, then we'll continue from there. So if you agree, uh, we can take a 10 minute break renew our coffees and everything and then be back here in 10 minutes let's say uh yeah let's 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 meet at 10 past 10. now it's 9 57 so let's let's reconvene at 10 past 10 and, and continue okay says